The islands of Dominica and St Vincent lie in the eastern Caribbean. They're part of the Lesser Antilles, a group of islands which separate the Atlantic Ocean from the Caribbean Sea. Descendants of the Carib Indians, who long ago migrated from Venezuela to the southern Caribbean, live on both of the islands in their own reservations. Like most of the islands in the Lesser Antilles, St Vincent is a volcanic island. Together with 32 other islands in the northern Grenadines, it forms the island nation of St Vincent and the Grenadines. Long before Christopher Columbus visited St Vincent, the island was settled by Indians from South America. In around 700 BC, the peaceful Arawak people were driven out by the Caribs after whom the Caribbean is named. In 1498, Christopher Columbus arrived in St Vincent. He found the island ruled by the Caribs. They were determined to defend the island, which they called Heroan, or Island of the Blessed, from foreign invasion. In contrast to the larger neighbouring islands, St Vincent remained uncolonised and free from European rule for over 200 years. Columbus described the Caribs as a warlike people. Um, they refer to them as being warlike, but I think what they were trying to do is to defend their ter territory and not just being warlike. It's obvious if anybody tried to come into your home and take it over, you would fight. And I believe that was one of their reasons for fighting. They were not just warlike, but they tried to defend themselves and their territory. In 1675, a Dutch slave ship ran aground near the islands. The African slaves were able to escape and lived among the Caribs, with whom they reproduced. The resulting ethnic group of mixed African and Carib descent are known as Garifuna. The Garifuna succeeded in remaining independent during the long struggle between France and England for control of the region. After the island was occupied by the British in 1795, the new settlers and colonial administration regarded the Garifuna with suspicion, as they were an example of free African slaves. The French allied themselves with the Black Caribs, but the conflict ended with their defeat in 1796. Black Point Tunnel on the east coast of St Vincent is a reminder of the slave period. The 113 metre long tunnel was built by slaves in 1815 on the orders of the British colonial administration to allow sugarcane to be loaded onto ships for export to Europe. Fort Charlotte is a British fortress built in the 18th century in the capital Kingstown. It's an impressive structure that's indicative of the Carib culture. The three remaining cannon all point towards the interior of the island, as it was the black Caribs who represented the greatest threat to the British. It was only in 2002 that Joseph Chateauier, the leader of the Garifuna, who died in a battle against the English in 1795, was proclaimed a national hero of St Vincent. He was uh, like um, a war hero. 
like when they over there were fighting between the French and the inhabitants there here he was in the front well it is believed that he was killed in a battle at Dorsester Hill which is in Kingstown and it was a battle against the English well they say he's the first one to stand up and fight for his country against the white colonial rule so he was the first one to organize a fight and defend his nation. That's why he became a national hero. Some of the Gadifuna still live on St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Despite suffering a long period of persecution, they're now officially recognized and have been granted equal rights. They remain conscious of the traditions of their ancestors and are anxious to keep them alive. Former years, the Garifuna people were looked down upon. They were looked at as the less fortunate and so on, the less educated. People try to belittle them. But I think recently a lot of focus have been made, been made on the Garifuna people and people see them differently. But I think before, um, they were despised. Right? So you cannot see it? Yes, until recently, focus have been put on them and now they are trying to get back into their tradition, like the food, the folklore, and so on. People are trying to revive the culture of the Garifuna. In the small village of Fancy, Garifuna continue to cook with traditional natural ingredients. Breadfruit or cassava and yams are prepared in one of the small huts. Cassava bread is cooked in a pan over a wood fire. Cassava root originally comes from South America and was part of the diet of the indigenous people of the Caribbean. When I was a little girl, I met the, my grandparents, parents, and everybody in the community planting these things. They call it cassava. And it grew from a tree. We scrape like how we scrape it, wash, and, and we, they grate it on the hand. Machine wasn't the, like now, they grate it on the hand. Work that was previously carried out by hand is made easier nowadays with technology. Long before this lady mother was born, even before my mother was born, it's a tradition. So it was almost out of existence, almost extinct. So we're trying to revive it, bring it back, because it's a staple food, it's a very healthy food. And anyone who partake of this food, they will feel great. Breadfruit, meanwhile, originates from the South Sea Islands. The plantation owners on the Caribbean islands needed an alternative basic food source because of shortages caused by independence struggles and hurricanes. And so breadfruit trees were imported from Tahiti to provide nourishment for the slaves. The nutritious breadfruit is placed directly in the oven, peeled and then eaten as a side dish with a range of foods, but primarily with fish. The island of Bekwe lies closest to the main island of St Vincent, near the well-known islands of Mustique and Palm Island. 
it's the largest island in the Grenadines. The name Bekwe comes from the language of the Arawaks and means Island of the Clouds. It's a young and friendly island where the pace of life is slow. When you ask what there is to do on the island, the answer is nothing. Whale hunting on Bekwe has a tradition going back centuries. Until well into the 20th century, it was an important part of the local economy and provided for the survival of the island's population. These days, the inhabitants have been given official permission by Greenpeace to hunt four humpback whales for their own consumption, using traditional methods involving a small boat and harpoon. The quota has never been filled. The fishermen of Bekwe were the first to document the singing of the humpback whale. The bulls sing a different song every mating season to attract a partner. Oh, Bekwe, the island that you're on, is a whaling station allowed to whale by the Greenpeace. It's been in our tradition for over a hundred years. The whale hunters' boats are made out of wood by the locals, using traditional methods. Boat building has a long tradition on Bekwe that has sustained the local economy. Ah, we use every part of the whale. The whale meat is a very delicacy for the locals on the island and we cook it in a traditional style called dovin and um, it is sold and divided up between the, the locals. Life in Roseau, the capital of Dominica, is much more hectic. Dominica lies between the French islands of Guadeloupe and Martinique in the Eastern Caribbean. The indigenous people called the island Waitukubili, or its body is high, in reference to its mountainous terrain. Because of the island's abundant and diverse animal and plant life, Dominica also has the unofficial title, the Nature Island. Over 300 rivers and streams are to be found on the island, as well as waterfalls and lakes. The largest freshwater lake on Dominica lies 762 metres above sea level. Called the Freshwater Lake, the body of water is contained in the crater of an extinct volcano. It serves nowadays as both a drinking water reservoir and hydroelectric dam. When Christopher Columbus discovered Dominica in 1493, he didn't set foot on the island. He named the island after the day of its discovery, a Sunday, which is Domingo in Spanish. Dominica was the last island colonised by Europeans because of the fierce resistance of the Caribs. The Kalingos live in a reservation in the east of Dominica known as Carib Territory. They're the descendants of the Caribs 
who ruled over the islands before the arrival of the Spanish. Colonization came to Dominica 200 years after every other island in the Caribbean was already colonized. History has taught us, wants to teach us, that we fought away of the Caribbean islands, ate out the Arawaks, then, then took over the islands. But the, the people who wrote the history was not there at the time. They were not there. So the history that they know is the history that they participated in, that they were part of. And that the history they were part of was the, the, what they recorded was our resistance to their taking over these islands, to setting up their plantations and, and taking our men and, and young men and, and, and into slavery, for raping and killing our, our, our women and children. We, we fought to resist colonization. Among those living in the reservation is a medicine woman who practices traditional healing methods using natural means. I use all the herbs around my house for healing. There are different herbs which can cure different illnesses. But I have to ask people who come to me to tell me the symptoms of the illness in order to be able to help them. This traditional medical knowledge of the Kalingos is handed down from one generation to the next. My parents used herbs to cure illnesses, and I have also learned to use everything that grows here. The knowledge is transmitted from generation to generation. My children can also apply the herbs, and their children are very interested in this law. As far as I know that she has performed uh, pretty close to 100 deliveries, delivered almost 100 babies without any complications, neither to baby or mother. And this is of, this is of special significance. Amazingly, she has been able, she was, she was able to deal with all these many cases that, that she encountered and deal with it successfully, with no loss of life. And she has never been to school. However, modern life has also arrived in the Carib territory. The young Kalingos are determined not only to preserve the traditions and culture of their people, but also to disseminate them. The whole idea of the whole going to um, commercialising of medicinal plants by the Kalingos heritage that it came about when there was a youth path program which was held in the Carib territory and um, in, in the year 2006. And in that program, 20, 20 participants um, took, took um, part in that ethnobody program where the whole gist of, of the program was to basically go, go about interviewing elderly people um, as to how the medicinal plants are being used traditionally and documenting all that information. Then from after the program was ended, the very same participants, we basically stayed together from the Cardinal Heritage Society and we decided to use that very same knowledge that we have acquired to go to actually to well, take the, this into a next level into going to commercializing of these very same traditionally used medicinal plants. The whole culture, medicines and all that, it is, um, it, medicines in, in itself is, um, is very important. It is, has been used by the Kainau kind of people for centuries, almost all their life, and even today they're still being used. And, and um, if, if there's a history in the Caribbean territory that um, or people don't normally go to doctors unless they can't heal them, unless they can't actually help themselves. You know, so um, this is, this is, which is, which is I am very proud of, that our oh, people can actually use our lo own local medicines, our own local herbs, which is grown in our backyard, around our yard, or around our surroundings, in the, in the various environments, that we can use and, and sustain a, a relatively healthy lifestyle.
Canoes are made in the Carib territory using traditional building methods. The boats are constructed from a single tree trunk, which is hollowed out and then expanded using fire. The dugout canoes were once used to transport people and goods. Even today, they remain irreplaceable for the fishermen of Dominica. In the centuries before, what we understand, but we, I don't know really if it's true, but what I understand is that they used to make it in the canoe by itself, one wood, by 60 feet long, and they would travel with it from here to the other countries like Marigaland or Martinique with it. But in a certain stage down the line, they most probably believe that it was not sufficient to hold the sea, the sea waters. So then they put an addition to it, which is called the border. They give it a stern and a bow, and they add another piece of wood, we call it a border, a plank, so that it comes higher and much stronger, so it can hold more, more load to travel. The tree trunks used for the canoes are felled in the surrounding rainforest. You go to cut it, and we cut it in, in the moon. We don't just going to cut it like this. We choose the moon to cut the wood to build our boats. Because when you cut it in the, in the, in the new moon, like the big moon is going to be big, all the termites, they go to it and eat. They spoil the wood. But when you cut it down, down way down the, the, the moon, you cut good wood like this because, I mean, plain wood, nice wood and whatever. And then from there now, when you lock the wood down, you cut the stomach and then you draw your skeleton and you start digging. St. Vincent and Dominica are two of the most untouched islands in the Caribbean. These two volcanic islands have the only Carib reservations in the whole of the Caribbean. It's here that the descendants of the people who gave their name to the region continue to live. They're the last remnants of a people who long resisted the colonial ambitions of the Europeans and never allowed themselves to be enslaved. Yeah.